Racing's dark beauty can be seductive. It is exotic, heroic, and sometimes cruel. As 1973 began, I would learn about living a life of consequence and the value of total commitment. It seemed like anything was possible as I entered my first full year of semi-adulthood with my pal Mike Van Adder, who shared my passion for art and for racing. We were inspired by Formula Ford racer Emerson Fittipaldi, who'd become F1 world champion in just four years. And also by America's first Formula Ford champion, Skip Barber, who'd reached Formula One and would be racing at SCCA Formula 5000. In early January, our racing dreams became real when a young SCCA racer named Claude Collignon gave me and my pals a chance to drive his Formula V at Willow Springs Raceway. I felt like I was driving as fast as humanly possible until Can-Am racer Milt Minter blew by me going 100 miles per hour faster in a Porsche 91710. On January 20th, my fellow Whittier High alumnus, Richard Milhouse Nixon, was on top of the world as he began his second term as the 37th President of the United States. The next day, my buddies and I were at Riverside International Raceway to witness Mark Donahue win the Winston Western 500, giving Penske Racing its first NASCAR victory. Around the same time, Mike and I were also working on illustration projects at Autosport Promotions Upscale Office in Torrance, California. Founder Alan Bouverat treated us well, and he began to introduce us to people who would help us find our direction. Among them was his client, Mark Monroe, who was our age and showed promise as a racer. Monroe shared a Formula Ford with an experienced front-running driver who was an instructor at the Jim Russell Racing School. His name is Mike Hall and his cool, calm, and focused mindset would soon become a major influence on my life. As we sat with my dad atop his new Winnebago to watch the Formula Ford support race before the opening F5000 round at Riverside, our eyes were on the bright red Eldon Mark VIII, driven by Alan Hawley, who was clearly the man to beat. I'm an amateur racer, which means I race for trophies instead of money. My crew are friends who want to be there and help get the car ready and roll it out to the pre-grid for me. It's a fun thing. The racers like me all over the United States. We work our jobs five days a week and race on the weekends. When the green flag says go, it looks like a freeway at five o'clock. This type of racing always draws a large field. It's very satisfying to race wheel to wheel with someone you know and you trust but it demands total concentration and really uses up the energy. The cars race very close together because they are very equal. Driver ability is what really makes the difference. When the checkered fly comes out and the pressure's off, cold drink of milk really tastes good. I always drink milk after a race. It quenches my thirst better than anything I've ever tried. Energized by the Formula Ford and F5000 races at Riverside, my dad and I were looking forward to pole day at Indy two weeks later. Rutherford starts out to qualify for his 10th Indianapolis race. Pole sitter Johnny Rutherford came tantalizingly close to a 200 mile per hour lap, but the quest for speed was overshadowed by veteran Art Pollard's tragic death in morning practice. Dad was busy in the days that followed with the troubled launch of Skylab and meetings at North American Rockwell about a new reusable spacecraft that his team was working on. But Dad was also experiencing relentless back pain, and he finally went to the local hospital on Memorial Weekend for a simple procedure intended to relieve his pain. On Memorial Day in 1973, my father and I viewed the start of the 57th Indianapolis 500 from the intensive care unit at Presbyterian Hospital in Whittier, California, where Dad had been diagnosed with lung and spinal cancer that morning. 
The Indy 500 was stopped multiple times due to accidents and rain and took three days to run. It also took the life of 22-year-old crewman Armando Turan, who was struck by a safety vehicle as he ran toward the scene of Swede Savage's horrific crash in Turn 4. Savage somehow survived the impact and was fighting for his life in intensive care. His teammate, Gordon Johncock, was awarded a joyless victory when the race was called after only 133 laps due to rain. It was just a year since I'd graduated from high school and my world was descending into darkness. But my friendship with Mike Manatter kept me connected and focused on what we both really wanted. We became involved with a young, would-be publisher named Don Alexander who was launching a new magazine. It was called Formula Ford Review, and Mike immediately redesigned it while we both created illustrations for its pages. On July 2nd, rising star Swede Savage died from unexpected complications from his injuries suffered in the Indy 500. He was only 26, and my dad and I were heartbroken. On July 29th, Roger Williamson, in only his second F1 race, perished in an accident at the Dutch Grand Prix. Despite the valiant efforts of fellow racer David Purley to save him, he was just 25 years old. As the sad, smoggy summer wore on, I somehow managed to get two speeding tickets and a reckless driving charge, despite LA's notorious traffic. The truth is that I really wanted to race in Formula Ford, so my emotional escape came at every local SCCA club racing weekend where I was making new friends and developing new clients. One was racer Hugh Mooney, who would play a big role in my future. Another was Dick Cooney, who'd left automotive development to launch a new race shop called Pacific Formula with the backing of a wealthy Chicago-based businessman, John Benton, who was now Cooney's Formula Ford teammate and on his two-car Super V team. Mike and I were now engaged in graphic design and advertising projects for the new company that distributed six different English racing car brands. After my daily visits with my dad in the hospital, I would often drive to Pacific Formula in Garden Grove, California to spend the evening in the race shop visiting with team mechanic Pete Halsmer. He always lifted my spirits while he prepped the team's twin 2EBH3 Super Vs that Mike and I had designed the liveries for. I was searching for small emotional victories and momentum amid the chaos and the gloom. It seemed that my hero, Mario Andretti, was also searching for momentum in a season with no Formula One starts and only one IndyCar victory to his credit. Meanwhile, I was inspired by Roger Penske's momentum and ambition with entries in USAC's 500-mile races, NASCAR, endurance racing, SCCA Formula 5000, and Can-Am. Imagine the pressure that is on all of us, myself and the crew, to do well with this, with this tremendous force. The car is quicker. At least our combination of car engine and team is quicker, but we have failed to win a race yet, and really that's what we're here for, is to win races. It's the only measure of success, so you can't say the car is successful yet. It was becoming clear to me that reaching the top and staying there was not easy, and that Penske Racing's success was based on an unrelenting commitment to excellence. But with the fourth annual California 500 approaching, Mike and I returned to Forging Passes. These were our best yet, with full access to the expansive press room atop the Ontario Motor Speedway main grandstand. We repeated our plan to give paintings to drivers, and I presented Mark Donahue with a watercolor of his 1972 L&M Porsche 91710. Later, Mark approached us with a brand new yellow bell helmet in his hand, and he asked us to use a marker pen to match the lettering on his old helmet. We worked with speed and precision, and Mark seemed genuinely grateful. He also seemed tired, but his sincerity and kindness inspires me to this day. On September 2nd, the California 500 was won by Wally Dollenbach, who'd replaced Swede Savage on Pat Patrick's team. We crashed the victory party, but I was numb because I knew in my heart what was coming and that my life would change forever. Ron Fanner died just before dawn on the morning of September 11, 1973. It was his 48th birthday. Two hours later, my sister Diane, whom my father adored, summoned the courage to attend her very first day at Whittier High School, just as Dad would have expected. That afternoon, I went to North American Rockwell in Downey, California, to retrieve his belongings, and his co-workers asked if I wanted to see what Dad had been working on. 
We entered a large building where I was stunned to see a massive full-scale mock-up of what would someday be known as the Space Shuttle Inspiration. I was overcome by the enormity of my father's life. In that moment, I saw past my grief and committed myself to my dreams. My dream was to race and to make racing my life. A year earlier, I was entering college, but I was never going back. Now I was 19, and I knew that I needed to start earning my place in the sport. Thankfully, my relationship with Mike kept me connected to Formula Ford Review. He completely redesigned the magazine, and it now had a new name and expanded focus. Formula debuted mid-September, filled with our artwork and our hope for the future. But there was no joy in this sad year. On Saturday, October 4th, Francois Severe was killed at Watkins Glen, New York, in qualifying for the United States Grand Prix. I was crushed by the news. World champion Jackie Stewart had planned on retiring the next day after racing in his 100th Grand Prix, but he walked away a day early following the loss of his close friend and teammate. The next day, the world began to spiral out of control. Synchronized with the Egyptian attack, a 50-minute artillery barrage began. This is NBC Nightly News, Wednesday, October 17th, reported by John Chancellor. Good evening. The Middle East War produced developments all over the world today. The oil-producing countries of the Arab world decided to use their oil as a political weapon. A week later, the second issue of Formula debuted, with Mark Donahue on the cover and my memorial illustration of Francois Severe. We again attended the Laguna Seca and Riverside Can-Am races. Mark Donahue dominated both weekends in Penske Racing's amazing Porsche 91730, and I was surprised but also relieved when he announced his retirement after winning the last race and the Can-Am championship. But Mark still had more races to run. The action would be called by someone dealing with grief, just like I was. I have working with me a superstar of motorsports, a man who won more Grand Prix championships than any man ever, 27 of them from Scotland, Jackie Stewart. Because this is really a new format for motor racing. This is the first time, in my opinion, that real show business has come into motor racing, Keith, and I think it's a great thing. And Jackie Stewart, as the field works its way, springing out a little bit through the S's and heading into the turn, I look at your face and I have the feeling you might like to be out there. Keith, this is just the kind of motor race I'd love to be in, but as you know, I've retired from motor racing altogether. And Five days later, we were thrilled when David Brun's futuristic ADF Mark II won the SCCA Formula Ford National Championship at Road Atlanta on its debut with Bob Earl at the wheel. It was a bold statement of intent to go far beyond Formula Ford. Through the grief of losing my father, I was inspired by this brave and brilliant group at Automotive Development, led by Paul White, whom I'd met the year before. His business partner was engine builder Jules Williams, who just happened to be the first person to win an SCCA Formula Ford National Race. They were uncompromising and focused on whatever it took to win. It started with a mindset of controlling everything that could influence the outcome. This was apparent to me in the design of David's original car that I noticed at Ontario Motor Speedway back in 1971. Like Roger Penske and Mark Donahue had demonstrated at the top of the sport, their true unfair advantage came down to the ability to learn faster and think bigger than the competition in every aspect. But the real lesson for me was that nothing would happen without total commitment and taking action. This was what my father was trying to teach me before he left this life, and now I was finally beginning to get it. But I was still far from being a grown-up, which would soon create consequences. I ordered a driving suit on the day of my father's funeral, and it arrived just before Christmas. So, with only 10 laps to my credit, I intended to go racing in 1974 without any real understanding of what it took. And I was ignoring the ominous storm that was coming. 